Patrick Hanenberger. I work as a production designer at uh, DreamWorks Animation. And tonight I'll give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look of our newest upcoming feature, Rise of the Guardians. Um, there's going to be a lot of really, really real behind the scenes work. So a lot of unfinished, unfinished unpolished work. Everything you see is going to be a work in progress. But I thought that would be a lot more interesting for you to see because you'll see the final thing hopefully later on this year. So. Um, at DreamWorks, we make five movies every two years. That's a lot of movies, and um, all those movies are animated. And every one of those movies fa um, faces new uh, technical and creative challenges that we, have to, that we have to overcome every single time. And uh, one thing I really want to stress tonight in my presentation is that it doesn't really matter what tool you use. It doesn't really matter what technology you use. It always comes down to the people who are actually doing the work. And so tonight I'll focus very much so on the collaboration, on the people that are actually behind the scenes doing the work, doing the, the actual artwork. Um, we're going to go through character designs, art department, previs. Here you see a tiny snippet of the about 350 people that have worked on this movie. Some, some of these are from the art department. Um, I wanted to put this slide up because on the bottom image in the middle, that's actually some of our fan art we've been getting over the last year. So we keep every single image from our fans. We print it out and we pin it up in the office. And uh, 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 we talked a lot about uh, crew morale earlier on this uh, 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 presentations, and uh, you know there you see one of our artists DJing on a home-built disco cart. So um, just to give a little bit of a, a behind the scenes here from our culture. But what we'll talk about tonight is these characters: the Sandman, the Easter Bunny, Father Christmas, the Tooth Fairy and Jack Frost. So Rise of the Guardians uh, is a movie that is reimagining these childhood heroes. And uh, uh, it was a tremendous privilege for me as a production designer to work on this film because I got to reinvent worlds that these characters would inhabit and uh, these worlds characters would live in. So tonight we'll talk about Rise of the Guardians. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit behind the scenes on the character design phase. We'll talk a little bit about the worlds that we created for these characters. I'm going to talk a lot about the collaboration that goes into the behind the scenes. And I'm also going to show you some work in progress documentaries. They're very, very rough. Um, so with that being said, let's start and uh, talk about characters. So this project started uh, many, many, many years ago and was actually originally created by William Joyce. William Joyce was inspired when his daughter asked him, hey, daddy, does the Tooth Fairy actually know the Easter Bunny? And so that for him you know, was the big creative spark. And influenced him so much that he started writing down these backstories and these mythologies right away for these characters. And when he brought this project to DreamWorks, he presented it in a way as an old mythology, as if these characters were actually real mythological characters, these characters that had been around for hundreds of years. And DreamWorks fell in love with the property and uh, started collaborating. Here you see some uh, early development art, which I had the pleasure of working with Bill Joyce very closely on this project. And uh, he was a huge inspiration for me for the production design of the movie. Um, some designs for the character North. These are some of his early designs for the Tooth Fairy. Um, here are some of his designs for Pitch the Nightmare King. And these are uh, all you know, characters that he had developed over the years trying to reimagine these um, childhood icons. What was really inspirational for me in his work is the amount of detail, the attention to detail, the amount of pattern that Bill Joyce has in his illustrative work. And this is something that I really, really wanted to continue in the design for the feature film. A quality of a picture book illustration with tons and tons of detail and basically create moving images that immerse you the same way a children's book illustration would. So the first phase after um, you know, a, co a conceptual project is developed like this is you usually start with the characters. And this is con character concept art done by uh, uh, Chris Appelhans, who also worked on this project. And what this does is it helps to develop the story. So story artists, writers, and concept artists work in sync with each other, and they create artwork that inspires basically the director and the studio, what could these characters really be? What could the potential be of these characters? Here's more artwork done by Ryan O'Loughlin. Um, and what then my job is as the production designer is pretty much to refine these characters and give them an aesthetic and really, really bring them to life from a design point of view. Um, so this is kind of some more final direction that we took with this, and this work is all done in 3D. Um, and where things really started clicking for me in the design process is when we started building these characters in 3D and designing them in 3D and shaping them as, as sculptures. 
Um, as soon as you kind of lay down an aesthetic really early on, uh, of course, throughout the collaboration, other people come on board and instantly poses get explored. How could this character move? Um, the head of character animation came up with this idea, well, he's wearing a hoodie, let's make that a big feature of his character design. So instantly he started sketching all these poses of Jack Frost wearing a hood. And uh, you know what that means for us instantly is that we have to create a hoodie task force and put an entire team to work to actually do the first animated character wearing a hoodie that he can take on and off, you know, on a hair, simulated hair. So big technical challenges. And again, I said tonight, you're going to see a lot of this stuff behind the scenes. So um, another example, the Tooth Fairy, uh, some big technical challenges we faced with her is we wanted to have a character that could emote through her feathers. And so we spent an incredible amount in the art department working with the character effects artists, designing feathers, laying out feather anatomy, building feather rigs so that these characters could articulate. And again, this is just a little bit of the behind the scenes showing you how something goes from very, very early, you know, conceptual artwork all the way into production. Um, here are some of the final images. Again, these are studies that we did uh, closer to the finished look of the design. And uh, 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 these are all done in Photoshop, just final renderings to, to kind of kick off the character into production. So with that being said, we're going to show you a first clip. This is a behind the scenes documentary uh, that I had the honor of directing. And this is about character design. Enjoy. All the characters in the movie are inspired and based on the mythologies that Bill Joyce created in his series of books, The Guardians of Childhood. Two of the first character designers that came on board to design this project were Ryan O'Loughlin and Chris Appelhans. Ryan and Chris had done some really, really beautiful breakthrough work that uh, took these characters Bill Joyce had created and brought them towards our DreamWorks universe. When we started working and putting this film really into production after it was greenlit, we had a wealth of concept art to pull from, somewhere in 3D, somewhere already rigged, somewhere just in sketch form and in paint form. And I had actually worked very intensively with Takao Naguchi, the character designer, and Hyun Ha, the head of uh, modeling, to unify all those characters. I was looking at a bunch of different character design from different people, different, you know, the taste, different tone, but I just tried to wipe out my head, you know, I just went to kind of, you know, really simple shape before starting character design, actually. I was just trying to nail down each one of the character in a simple, simple shape. First thing that when we started to, to building the character, I mean, we set up the rule with Patrick and like, not. The, the basic idea is like all the, the body and like the arm and the leg a little bit long and skinny. We developed a character style guide very early on. So this character style guide was based on a simple proportional principle. Limbs and legs of characters are long and skinny. Torsos are short and heads are slightly oversized. Or the character has the, the rule that the from the eyebrows to nose, there's one little kind of clean line on here. It's happening to every single character, even the generic one, is make it every character in the same universe. Takao had introduced a very simple shape language into the characters. What we then did is we brought in Nate Rag, who was currently on the, on the show as a graphic designer. And uh, I had asked him to illustrate basically all the ideas that had been done before and to cows kind of shape character design into a character style guide. So Nate Rag did a really amazing job in illustrating all these different conceptual ideas, the backstory of North, how North became a toy maker, what made Tooth a hummingbird, um, who does Bunny protect, how does Sandman get his dreams, and these really beautiful little icons, and then coming up with a color palette and the shape language for this world. You know, North's shape motif is a square. The patterning on North's code is based on square type shape language. 
So you notice every single detail in his world has little squares and interlocking puzzle pieces together. Sandman, again, the circle, the most magical abstract shape, uh, the infinite number of pi which defines a circle, all these things that are associated with circles that are magical. And for Jack, he came up with the idea of an hexagon. So a hexagon is, again, represents a snowflake. It's a multifaceted, it's a very complex shape. Just like Jack's character, he's a multifaceted, complex person that's finding his identity throughout the movie. Head shape and then even a little bit kind of on the nose area in here is all kind of the, like kind of combined with the, his motif. Even the finger, even the, the winkle is represent all kind of octagon shape in here. And also stick. I was just trying to design something a little bit indication about snowflake shape in here too. So in a way, we used the big shape motif that we created for the character design and then extrapolated it into the world. These shapes are hardwired into the DNA of these characters. Everything, as things start to click, so with the director and the producer, they started to really relate to it. It became a common language. We could talk about colors, we could talk about shapes, motif, story. It really helped to organize these six different universes and you know the, the whole world of the Guardians. The inspiration for me was taking that idea of a shape and somehow putting it into movement. Whenever kids come out of movies, if they love a character, they tend to go home and they draw that character. And I kind of had this, this little desire that if we could come up with really specific ways of moving each character that was so recognizable, maybe kids would go home and not only try to draw these characters, but try to be these characters. And they could because they knew how they moved. We're dealing with these icons of childhood that are so crazy and so overwhelming and daunting to design because no matter what you do, you will most certainly fall into some sort of a cliche that has been done before. I mean, everyone's seen hundreds of versions of Santa Claus. How do you come up with something fresh and unique? Just the fact that he has tattoos, naughty and nice, kind of gave us an edge. Well, maybe, there, maybe he's a little bit like a biker or something like that. So we kind of started realizing that if you think about Santa Claus, you know, he's a guy that's going to look at your child and he's going to judge your child whether your child's been good or not. That guy needs to be a little bit off kilter. He needs to be a little bit strange. So what we did was we just started thinking out of the box. Even though he's big, he needs to be slightly more childlike. Well, maybe his movement shouldn't be very heavy. It really took away the cliche quite quickly. You are going to have company. There was always something that felt a little bit awkward about the bunny from the first few designs where it was a guy in a robe. It didn't feel like he would be able to be agile enough and he was this scientist, so it made sense. Fussy. Yeah, he was very fussy, but you know, it, 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 it's not the most appealing of character traits to be a fussy scientist somehow. It just didn't allow for his movement to be, you know, graceful. And then we gave him that Outback slicker and there was these ideas kicking around that well, maybe, since he's from the Outback maybe we give him this jacket and he's running around and we did all these tests with him and it looks super cool but then it just again it did, didn't feel right and then I think it was you and I Patrick that were talking one day and we just thought well maybe the reason it didn't work is because we're trying to force something onto him a costume and as soon as we took that off stripped him down to just a rabbit it started to feel somewhat right. Um, and in order to get him more upright, more upright standing, we looked at animals like kangaroos that have really strong hind legs and kind of mixed a kangaroo, a rabbit, and a man together. And that's how we basically came up with the basic animation and movement of the character. So Tooth Fairy was fun. Uh, right away we just said, well, let's never let her walk. And that was kind of a weird idea because you always have to have characters walking around. I mean, could that work that she's always flying? And then we started doing some tests of, of just based on a very simple hummingbird, dragonfly kind of creature with a little bit more weight because she's bigger. It just never let her touch the ground. And as soon as we made that choice, we just started doing all these tests and it just felt right. So we looked at hummingbirds uh, and pheasants and uh, peacocks and really studied those feathers, how they worked. and 
basically took a creature mixed with a human and, and made something that the audience someone was familiar with but had never really seen before in this format. Sandman was really tricky. The hard thing was to figure out well, what to do with this little guy who's shorter than everyone. He's going to always be out of frame. And so we, as, you know, as we started to develop his movement, Alexi started doing these little tests of him walking and just very slowly hovering over the side of a building where it was like he could float somehow. And then that kind of struck this idea that, well, maybe he's not affected by gravity in the same way as other guardians or humans. Maybe he can float and why not? I mean, he's a, he's a superhero. Sandy is making me feel like Sandy Beach. And so that's the reason I put the seashell in here as a, just a concept of this moment. And then having the wave is kind of, wind is blowing the sand and making this kind of pattern. Actually, this movie file helped a lot to get the approval. This kind of floating feeling. I put just a little particles to show how he's going to express himself. Pitch is all the opposite of all the colors of the guardians. In that case, that makes that grays. So he has warm and cool grays. The nightmares which he's created are the invert of the dream sand. So the dream sand is bright and golden and warm. The nightmares are black, dark. When you look at the secondary characters, the elves, the yetis, the mini teeth, all these other little eggs, these, these characters, we wanted to treat them just a lot, a lot more cartoony. So elves are very stiff and they're kind of rigid and they're really funny and bouncy and the eggs are just bouncy little cartoony characters. They're sort of regular animation almost in a way. But then we wanted to add this sort of, for lack of a better word, this sort of badass quality to some other characters like the reindeers in the nightmare. We just studied the heck out of like big Clydesdales pulling sleighs or moose, how they move or something really strong and powerful and try to get that into these, these creatures where they really were beasts. And then the nightmares, just how they move, they're so elegant in their design with these floaty tentacles that trail off them. But again, the movement is really based on a real powerful horse creature, sort of a horse snake-like thing. With CFX, we do a lot, we do a lot of simulations, so there's a lot of clothing, and in this film we're actually being able to push the envelope of doing a lots of folds and really creative and really interesting. Jack's hoodie has been great, I mean it's actually been challenging. He's actually fairly s slender, but I mean the, the big sweeping folds and the really graphic designs for Jack has been great. Tooth Fairy, she's kind of this character that is feathers, but not, you know, I mean, not being a real character, we really had to rethink how we wanted the flow of the feathers and the size of the feathers. We're not do dealing with anything that's real life. Having an idea of how those work and then getting the art direction from the art department was, uh, was really helpful. Uh, one of the controls that we've hooked in with animation is allowing um, Tooth and Mini Tooth to kind of fluff their feathers, so to, to take the feathers and actually kind of roll them up. So when she gets upset and she gets really fluffed up, the feathers will actually kind of move up like this. But doing Norse beard actually has been the coolest. A long white beard on a black fur coat where you can't really hide a lot, and the fact that the beard is flowing and and we have it clumpy and we're doing the hair and, and trying to integrate it with the face and make sure that animation still gets all their facial expressions. It's been, it's been really challenging, but I think the output has been amazing. I'm a big fan of vinyl toys, so I just wanted to have a little bit vinyl toy feeling, but the surface should be a little more complicated as a kind of real life characters. I like the visual, it's really great beautiful look.